Enza. He is uh, an eye doctor. Then I will dwell on uh, eye diseases. And then uh, Dr. Emisenio will talk about uh, retinal uh, stress due to glaring. And finally, Dr. Tripodi will focus on uh, uh, the type of lenses uh, to improve uh, vision and to uh, avoid uh, glaring. So, Costantino Bianchi will start this workshop. So, thank you very much, Professor Spinelli. Good morning to everybody. So, my topic can we please go back to the previous slide? Thank you. So I'm going to dwell on the mechanisms related to the ability to see. So vision functions are extremely complicated. They are made up of multiple functions, visual acuity, visual sight, chromatic sensor, light sense and stereoscopic sense. But as we'll see later, visual acuity is uh, uh, made up of uh, uh, different features and the same holds true for the other uh, functions. Uh, that's the reason why this concept is extremely complicated. Uh, the basic mechanisms of these functions, uh, which as I said are very complicated, are in reality rather elementary mechanisms. Uh, so we have to identify those uh, that are uh, related in particular to driving. And we always have to keep these br uh, bricks in mind because they will explain uh, what we see later. So the architrave is actually the very first uh, uh, element of the chain, um, photometers. Uh, that is 120 to 130 million light sensors. So it's like an exposimeter of a camera. The evolutionary process selected two types of photometers, the cones, that in order to work require a relatively high level of light. So what do we mean by that? That's the light of a candle or slightly less, so it's not actually very high. And the second, rods, also work with very low levels of light. One quantum is enough for them to work. However, they do not have a very high resolution power, so they do not allow for a great vision, and they have no directionality. The evolutionary process also selected among cones uh, population that is uh, sensitive to green, to red, and to blue. And uh, thanks to their high resolution power, this selection allows also to define uh, different nuances. Uh, however, you cannot uh, see colors uh, in the dark, uh, as uh, we all know. A second element, uh, which is uh, extremely important in the visual mechanism is diffraction due to the presence of the pupil. These phenomena so transform an object which is perceived as a light dot on a black background on the retina is actually a, a series of uh, diffraction brands, uh, uh, bands uh, that uh, involves uh, at least uh, six to eight uh, photoreceptors. Uh, if we increase uh, the brightness of this object, uh, we see it as if it were bigger. And uh, here you see what happens. On the top, uh, you see a green band uh, with only one crest and uh, so this is perceived as a very small bond, uh, a dot. If this band increases, it cuts multiple crests and you see that the dot becomes bigger and uh, so the bigger the band, the bigger the dot. All the, la the stars we see in the sky are actually perceived uh, 
uh, with the same angle. However, we see them uh, with different sizes because uh, uh, they have a different, uh, uh, a different type of bright brightness. So if emipropia is not corrected, uh, these uh, circles uh, is going to be wider and uh, emitropia, if emitropia is bigger, those uh, circles are bigger as well. So as a consequence, uh, as uh, uh, the number of uh, uh, quanti reaching the retina is always the same, so uh, the target will be perceived uh, with a lower contrast uh, if they are diluted uh, on a more on a bright on a wider area so if you ever used uh, an amplifier to magnify the stars uh, you uh, can become aware of this phenomenon so you can also see those stars that are not bright enough to be perceived by our eyes. The beauty of this mechanism is the following. If the object is dark against a lighter background, the opposite occurs. If we increase the brightness of the background, because we cannot increase black, so the object seems to get smaller and smaller because at a, set, at a certain point it will be hidden by the diffraction bands and it will no longer be perceived. And this is a problem when you drive and that's the problem of glaring that will be dealt with afterwards. During an eclipse, for example, you see that the sun uh, hides a part of the moon. In reality, the moon is still there, there, but it is covered by the diffraction bands of the sun. Well, this is a peculiarity that could lead a driver who can see very well um, not to see a pedestrian wearing dark uh, clothes and being next to a very bright source of light. A further evolution or a further complication of the system is represented by the so-called receptive fields. You always have to keep in mind that no photoreceptor, apart from uh, some cones, uh, work individually. They always work in groups and this could be uh, a result of the evolution of the pupil that involves uh, multiple photoreceptions. So in order for the vision to occur, multiple photoreceptors have to be activated, the so-called photoreceptive fields. There are receptive fields that act as facilitators, the on centers, and those having an off center and that works as inhibitors. There are area of the retina which are stimulated much more easily and other areas that are inhibited in vision. It may sound a bit complicated, however, this is extremely important when driving. If the peripheral retina is stimulated by an object, for example, a child jumping off the sidewalk, the photoreceptors that, that perceive the movement of the child are alerted, so facilitated, and the other ones are inhibited instead, so that we can focus on the object we are interested in. Another uh, mechanism, well, this mechanism is uh, uh, then complemented with another uh, mechanism that uh, triggers um, a function that, uh, in a matter of a few seconds, uh, moves and shifts the image to the foveal region. In uh, many sports uh, disciplines, uh, this mechanism is extremely important. Uh, so, and this allows to uh, see who the professionals are. Professional. Uh, sports people are uh, will usually train uh, the foveal region and uh, uh, well this is extremely important when you drive here you see the receptive fields both uh, on and off and on the right hand side of the picture you see that uh, when a receptive when an on the receptive field is stimulated the impulse get uh, through 
when the off receptive field is activated instead, light cannot get through. Those features lead to many different phenomena. For example, the MAC bands. On the left hand side, you see a very interesting picture. There are bars that are extremely homogeneous, but by you they are perceived as if they had a darker and a lighter edge. Can you see it? And this also leads to another visual phenomenon. If you observe the image on the left hand side, it seems, uh, well, it looks like a Doric column. So it looks concave. That is, it doesn't look flat due to the light conditions. Let's now focus on the various components of vision. As I said, it would be more appropriate to talk about the visual equities because we have the visibility equity, the minimum visible field, the resolution equity, and that's the minimum separable field, spatial equities. Uh, like uh, Vernier, movement, uh, shape, orientation. You see there are many different types of equities. And here you see, for example, the, revolution, the resolution equity that allows you to see, for example, uh, this checker and uh, uh, when we measured the visual equity, we just uh, measure the resolution equity. This is the nonius, and the arrow that you see on the left hand side so is when the two lines are parallel. On the right hand side, you see that there is a slight difference, but to perceive this difference, you need five or six seconds which is much more than the visual equity of twin, uh, 12 uh, tens. So to recognize uh, an optotype, uh, we use uh, two visual abilities, uh, the separable minimum, so the resolution equity, and the recognizable minimum, uh, which is uh, uh, connected to the culture or to the intellectual abilities uh, of the person. So here, for example, you can see much better the image on the left hand side. The one on the right hand side is much more complicated. So the visors will be certainly lower with the right hand side image than with the left. So it is very important to specify the optotype that you're using to measure visual acuity. This is a first uh, differentiation. Now, however, when you drive, uh, spatial equities are also involved, uh, movement, shape, orientation, and the visibility equity is not so much involved. It would mean that you're able to see um, something in the fog, so that's pure visual equity. It is also important to point out that the maximum visual acuity is obtained when you uh, get to 589 nanometers. And this is the reason why uh, the parts of the street so that can be um, uh, that uh, are subject to mist or fog are usually uh, illuminated with uh, specific uh, lamps. So, for example, if you pass under a railway station or in very dark uh, uh, parts, uh, you can't see the colors any longer. So, visual fields. Um, there are many visual fields. Uh, the static perimetry, for example, is the measurement of the visible minimum, and that's the visibility equity. The dynamic perimetry is the measurement of the visible minimum. So these are two different visual fields. And then based on the adaptation, and uh, uh, 40 years ago, Professor Spinelli was teaching me all the different uh, uh, characteristics of the visual fields, so I have to thank him for the great knowledge he was able to transfer to me. So you see, we can 
measure visual uh, fields in many different ways. Uh, we use uh, specific types of paper. We project uh, uh, stimuli directly on the uh, retina, evocative uh, potentials, evoked potentials, etc. And this is required to uh, realize that uh, visual fields are very difficult to, to uh, compare to one another. They are not the same. Uh, so uh, in a scotopic adaptation, for example, we have a central uh, scotoma. That is, we cannot see uh, what is in the middle. We just uh, see what is in the periphery. And then the uh, chromatic sensor, which is the measurement of the separable minimum, uh, this is something, this is a function of the cones, and this changes uh, based on the adaptation to light. In the dark, uh, you move towards the blue uh, color, you see the same flower, pictures of the same flower. How can I go back to the previous slide? Well, it doesn't matter. So you saw three pictures uh, of the same uh, flower. And then the stereoscopic sense is the measurement of the separable minimum in depth, so not on the side, but on the z-axis. And this depends on binocular vision and on the integration of the images at a cortical level. With time, this integration this integration allows it to have a pseudo three-dimensional vision, also in case of a monocular vision. In conclusion, even if I had to be very quick, I hope I was able to give you an idea about uh, how complex the system is. Uh, however, it is based on some fundamental basic mechanisms. The first, the ability to perceive a very small object on a background of a different color. It would be extremely interesting to see what tests can be used to measure all the different abilities that I mentioned. However, this uh, would uh, lie outside of my framework. Uh, this is the take-home message of my presentation. The methods that are usually used to see whether a person can drive uh, have very important limitations uh, because you run the risk of not being able to identify some important gaps for drivers. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Good morning. So, Dr. Bianchi spoke about a physiopathological mechanism underlying vision. How can I go on with the slides, Costantino? And uh, hence, uh, those uh, that uh, deal with uh, vision uh, should provide the best vision uh, to patients. Uh, you know that uh, recently legislation was passed, uh, legislation on uh, driving license, uh, and uh, things have changed. We shall see it in our last slide. Uh, and. Uh, we should take into account what was said by Dr. Bianchi before. And uh, we should remember that, unfortunately, and uh, these are the latest data in 2002, um, 264,000 people wounded uh, and uh, 3,653 people died. Uh, and. Uh, uh, especially those uh, over eight years of age and uh, uh, young people. And in the case of young people, uh, you have high-speed uh, abuse of alcohol and drugs, the uh, use of uh, cell phones. Uh, and uh, while I was coming here, I was listening to the radio uh, in station for 
car drivers, and there was a program on the abuse of a smartphone by the youth when they drive, and uh, that's extremely negative. Uh, with regard to people over 80 years of age, uh, medical conditions uh, create a higher likelihood uh, uh, of accidents. And uh, as I said before, the lawmaker passed uh, new uh, rules uh, on the renewal of driving licenses. Uh, 85, 90 percent uh, of uh, the information uh, get into our brain. Uh, uh, such information gets uh, to the brain uh, through uh, our eyes. Uh, 85 percent of information and in driving 90% of information uh, gets uh, through our eyes. That's why it is important to have good vision uh, for safe driving. And uh, considering what uh, Costantino Bianchi said, uh, it's difficult uh, today uh, to know the degree of best vision for safe driving and not so much uh, to get a driving license. So my task uh, is uh, to remind you of eye diseases interfering with uh, everyday uh, activities of patients and especially driving and how they interfere. And uh, eye diseases uh, are cataract, uh, glaucoma, hemianopsia, diabetic retinopathy, uh, age-related maculopathy, and uh, diplopia. Cataract, uh, you know what it is. It's an opacity of the crystalline lens, that lens uh, just behind the pupil, and approximately 50% of people over 75 year years of age have initial cataract, uh, and in 25% of the cases, they have worsening. And for sure, people with cataract have bigger difficulty to drive at night in bad weather conditions and in crowded roads. And there are USA studies proving that people with cataract have 2.5 more likelihood to have accidents uh, than people uh, of the same age uh, without cataract. And cataract uh, causes a reduction uh, in uh, visual acuity. It causes an alteration uh, of the visual field. It can cause uh, monocular diplopia and uh, reduced uh, night vision uh, reduction uh, in uh, contrast sensitivity and an increase uh, in uh, um, clear disability. And uh, you see a vision of a monument uh, of a 70-year-old uh, uh, patient uh, person without uh, cataract, the vision of a patient uh, with uh, cataract. On the right, uh, you have what a patient uh, sees, uh, a patient with cataract, uh, when uh, uh, he sees uh, uh, the lights uh, of a car in front uh, of him. Glaucoma affects 6-7% of the European population, progressive loss of fibers of the optical nerve, and it's a chronic asymptomatic disease. If the patient doesn't have periodical visits, it's difficult for the patient to realize that he or she is affected by the glaucoma, and it's inherited. Uh, if you have a familiarity for glaucoma, uh, you should have uh, a night visit after 40 years of age uh, to assess the presence of glaucoma, and it gives an alteration of the visual field from the periphery toward the center. For sure, patients uh, with glaucoma have uh, difficulties uh, to drive, uh, uh, patients with monolateral glaucoma, but especially patients with bilateral glaucoma. That's the picture. You see the progression of uh, the evolution of the visual field of a patient with glaucoma. Uh, on the top uh, left 
inside uh, you see an arch shaped scotoma it's that uh, part of the visual field that is blind and uh, uh, on the uh, right uh, hand side uh, at the bottom uh, you just have a small piece of vision so you see uh, how fundamental it is uh, to have early diagnosis uh, of the problem. A diagnosis uh, performed uh, in the first uh, two stages, uh, the two slides uh, on the top, with adequate uh, therapy, uh, be it medical therapy, parasurgical therapy, surgical therapy, it can block uh, the evolution of uh, uh, the disease. Uh, and a patient uh, with the final stage of the disease is blind. And we have another disease that has an impact on vision. It's a eye disease, but usually it is associated with neurological diseases. Hemianopsia, that is to say, lack of visual field on the one hand or the other. On the one side or the other. It can be bitemporal, hemianopsia, and so on and so forth. Mm. Most important uh, uh, alterations are by temporal hemianopsias, uh, uh, and uh, it uh, leads uh, to the disappearance of the so-called tail of uh, the eye. And uh, uh, if you have the problem on the left, uh, uh, when you drive, uh, uh, it's a big problem, uh, and uh, uh, it involves uh, a big deficit. You see. Here, how a patient uh, sees uh, with hemianopsia uh, of the right quadrant. That's how the patient sees. And uh, here you see what uh, a patient with hemianopsia uh, sees, uh, right uh, hemianopsia. He doesn't see the half on the right. We have two other diseases uh, that can cause uh, damage. Uh, eye damage, but they can also cause difficulties in vision. Diabetic retinopathy, it's a complication of diabetes, and especially insulin-dependent diabetes. And remember, it's an increasing disease because diabetes is on the increase, not just in Italy, but all over the world. And unfortunately, you have uh, so many people with diabetes, uh, and uh, uh, they don't have a eye visit, unfortunately. Diabetes uh, uh, can cause uh, considerable reduction in central vision, but uh, it can also cause especially major alterations of the visual field. And uh, in the right-hand side picture, you see how a diabetic uh, patient uh, sees an object uh, he's staring at uh, in black. He have scotomas, uh, small scotomas of the visual field uh, that uh, uh, can cause uh, a big interference uh, when you drive. Uh, then uh, you have uh, macular degeneration uh, connected to age. It's the first uh, cause of uh, blindness in the world, and especially in industrialized countries. It's the first cause in Italy. and. Uh, this disease uh, affects uh, the central macular region. It starts uh, after 60, 70 years of age, and it increases exponentially. And uh, more than 10, 5% of uh, uh, the population over 75 years of age is affected by it, and it creates a disability uh, in every uh, day activities and also in the case of driving. Here, you see what a patient sees with an age-related maculopathy. On the left, you have an early stage of maculopathy, and the patient sees the image blurred. On your right, you see a central scotoma when the disease is at an advanced phase. And uh, one last element uh, that interferes with driving is diplopia. It means uh, seeing double. It can be horizontal, vertical, oblique, and causes. It can be local, 
eye related causes, neurological causes, and you see the image on the right. Uh, uh, subject uh, driving a uh, subject with diplopia and how the subject uh, sees a car uh, uh, going in the opposite direction. And I'd like to end uh, going back to what Costantino Bianchi said, uh, and we should thank uh, Costantino Bianchi for what he said, because you don't have so many eye physicians uh, dealing with uh, eye physiology. and. Uh, the latest uh, legislative uh, rules uh, passed state uh, that uh, in the evaluation of uh, uh, vision, uh, you shouldn't uh, simply assess uh, central visual acuity, but uh, you should also assess uh, contrast sensitivity, uh, sensitivity to glare, time of recovery after glare, and uh, visual field. At this point, I'd like to thank you, and uh, um, I have spoken as president of uh, Società Italiana di Ophthalmologia Legale. Yes, we deal with uh, medical legal issues, but also prevention uh, and ergonomics uh, related issues, and uh, all of such aspects uh, fall within uh, the uh, objectives of our association. I'd like to give the floor at this point uh, to Dr. Messenio, an eye doctor, electrophysiologist and he speaks about glare, photo stress. So, glare. What do we mean by glare? Glare is what happens when the pupil is not able to adapt to the brightness of light. And this triggers a complete consumption of the photoreceptor pigments. So that's the phototransduction, so the transformation of a light impulse into an electric impulse, and the vision is not clear any longer until those photopigments are recovered again. And this is what usually happens during glaring, especially when driving. And so, we can also have a permanent damage due to uh, glaring, especially when you stare. When you stare at the sun during a sun eclipse, uh, or when you expose uh, your eyes uh, to a very bright uh, source of light uh, during welding, for example. The glaring phenomenon was uh, dealt with uh, by Herbert Pearson uh, in the early 20th century. He sent an article to the newly formed Engineering Society for Lighting in London, and uh, he asked a question about glaring. So glare can be divided into four macro groups. Uh, invalidating glare, disability glare, which is due to uh, diffuse light, uh, stray light, uh, and uh, this reduces visibility, of course. So uh, the lights of uh, a car, for example, in a poorly lit uh, street, uh, and this type of glare increases with age uh, due to the progressive uh, change of the crystalline lens. So the crystalline lens uh, becomes yellow with time, uh, and uh, we have a progressive scattering of the light uh, getting into the eye due to the uh, lamelle that uh, spread uh, the light uh, into uh, the eye. And then we have the discomfort uh, glare, which is uh, a normal reaction to an abnormal situation. This varies uh, among the different subjects and increases uh, based on the number, on the incidence angle. If you have a glaring light uh, very close, uh, 
to the axis, uh, glare will increase, of course. Uh, so there will be a higher glare within uh, five degrees of the visual axis and a maximum peak uh, on the wavelength uh, of green uh, between uh, 510 and 590 nanometers. In this case, uh, for example, we have a discomfort glare that is a very discomfortable glare when you get into a very bright lit road, for example. Then we have a more intense uh, glare, which is the so-called dazzling glare. The dazzling glare is due to a very uh, high uh, intensity of light against the retina that leads to uh, temporary or prolonged uh, discomfort. For example, when you drive uh, at sunset uh, with the uh, sunlight uh, uh, directed against your eyes uh, or with very strong uh, uh, car lights. Then we have the scotomatic photostress, uh, which is the highest glare that doesn't lead to permanent damages uh, to the eyes. So you run out completely of the photopigments of the retinal photoreceptors, as we said, and post images can be created. For example, if you look at a shutter illuminated by the sun, uh, and uh, or then when you move your eyes uh, from the shutter, you can still see the lamellae of the shutter. And these are the so-called uh, post-images. This phenomenon increases with age, and this is caused, for example, by staring. By staring for a longer period of time, uh, the car lights uh, or specific lights, uh, you get a scotoma. Uh, you completely run out of uh, photopigments. And then moving on, you have the solar uh, retinopathy leading to a permanent damage, as we uh, heard uh, uh, during the previous presentation. There are some subjective and objective methods uh, to assess glare. Uh, you use uh, the, um, opt uh, the, the C optotype that Professor Bianchi uh, mentioned. Uh, there are three types of measurements. I will hint at that because we have to focus on uh, myopic eyes. And myopic eyes, of course, uh, have more difficulties uh, in uh, glare, especially when driving at night time. And I will explain you uh, why. So me the measurement of the uh, night vision threshold is done in a darker room. So you look at uh, the C optotype, but you decrease the light of the optotype and you read until you can. So the more you can go down with light, the better the sensitivity in the darkness, and that's the night vision. The second assessment is the measurement of the adaptation threshold. So you glare, you then decrease the light of the optotype and you see um, how can you reduce light in order to allow the, the patient to see. At the same time, you also measure the recovery time after, after uh, glare uh, in seconds. So you glare and then you see uh, how much time the patient requires to read the optotype again. There is uh, an assessment uh, scale which is uh, expressed uh, in uh, uh, candles per square meters. So based on the sensitivity threshold uh, for uh, night vision adaptation to glare and recovery time, there is uh, then uh, um, a scale from good to bad. If you look at the first column on the left, for example, you see the night vision threshold that I mentioned earlier. Uh, myopic patients uh, rank uh, fourth, uh, so below average. They have uh, a lower uh, night vision sensitivity as well as uh, a lower dark adaptation threshold. And so we will see later why. Also the recovery time is higher after glare. This is due to the fact that there are many variables to take into account considering the quality of functional recovery after glare. So the illumination of the eye, that is adaptation, the luminance, the spectrum, the color of the uh, glare source, then the environmental conditions, if it's raining, if the sun is shining, etc. because we are referring to driving, the age and uh, health uh, status of the patient, and ametropias. Ametropias may be myopia, 
uh, hyper hyperoptic patients, uh, astigmatism, for example. So amyotrophic patients, uh, those patients having these uh, uh, visual defects, uh, have uh, a higher night uh, uh, night uh, vision uh, threshold. Myopic patients have uh, a higher night vision threshold and more difficulties by when uh, by poor light with poor lights and this is because the pupillar diameter decreases with poor light and uh, for this reason the dilation of the pupil leads to aberration and an alteration in the perception of the image at a retinal level. So the image is blurred. As the, the pupil is a bit more dilate, dilated than non-myopic patients, when uh, glare is there, they have more difficulties. And this is the reason why myopic patients are driving at night have more difficulties than other patients than other people who are not uh, myopic patients. Uh, this is, for example, what a uh, myopic patient uh, can see when driving at night. This, of course, uh, leads to a higher number of accidents, as Professor Spinelli pointed out earlier. So methods, uh, simple intuitive methods, uh, have to be developed in order to decrease glare during uh, night driving. The, higher number, uh, the highest number of accidents occurs uh, uh, at night uh, and the mortality rate is three to four times higher at night. So you have to control to check the car prior to driving it. The windshield uh, has to be clean. The lights uh, has to be, uh, have to be clean. Uh, they have to be aligned. during the inspections of the car. This is extremely important because sometimes you have non-aligned car uh, lights uh, leading to an abnormal glare and this can lead to a higher number of uh, accidents. If the light is not properly aligned, if it is too high and uh, 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 glares at the uh, driver, this can also lead to a higher uh, glare. It is also important uh, to properly adjust uh, the mirrors. Uh, the uh, left mirror, for example, has to be properly adjusted in order to see the left corner of the car, and the same applies to the right uh, mirror. And um, you also have to adjust the filter of the back mirror in order to avoid a glare from the cars that are coming from the back. So there are many uh, methods and mechanisms to avoid a glare during driving and then uh, many other simple um, uh, measures like uh, um, frequent brakes, for example, especially when driving at night. I will now focus very quickly on the mechanisms that are involved in the retinal photochemical damage. I will be very brief on that just to explain how from a functional viewpoint glare is worse in elderly patients. So the retina has evolved in order to be able to capture those uh, uh, photoreceptors and transform the light uh, impulse into uh, an electrical impulse. And uh, this increases with the wave. This depends on the wavelength. Um, this is a photoelectric mechanism. This means that uh, the uh, light uh, rays with a shorter wavelength, uh, such as the blue uh, rays, are more photo phototoxic uh, for the eye. There are many mechanisms that allow the eye to filter off this uh, uh, light energy through the cornea, through the crystalline lens that gets yellow with time, as we said. However, there are also other elements to take into account. There are some changes due to aging, and this is normal. So we have to focus on two main elements. 
within uh, the analysis of glare, there are two elements, as we said, photoreceptors and uh, pigmented uh, epithelium. The pigmented epithelium uh, lies behind uh, the retina and has uh, two functions. It absorbs uh, diffuse uh, light, stray light, so it's like absorbing paper that absorbs uh, the photons and the second function is that of a scavenger. It cleans and removes the degradation that occurs at a photoreceptor level. This pigmented epithelium, however, degenerates with time. It is not replaced. So the retina of an adult or an elderly patient is less efficient because it is not able to uh, remove uh, the residues that are coming from the photoreceptors. Uh, and this can lead to a higher glare sensitivity and at a second stage, uh, the development of uh, uh, disability um, uh, disorders and conditions uh, like uh, age-related uh, maculopathy. And in this case, a uh, blue light is also involved. Uh, the blue light uh, has uh, the highest amount of energy due to the photoelectric uh, mechanism that I mentioned earlier. After a cataract, uh, you have uh, 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 more sensitivity to light. Uh, and so there is also the need to implant intraocular lenses that are able to filter because the eye has to reposition itself in the paraphysiological conditions of an elderly eye with a yellow crystalline lens that tries to reduce the light impact at a retinal level. Just a couple of minutes. Well, concerning the objective assessment, um, we performed uh, a study on glare and uh, considering the recovery time uh, as a function of the age. So you see, for example, the function of the macula in elderly patients, which is much lower than in younger patients, uh, the uh, light blue bars are at the top, and you see that uh, the recovery time is also less efficient. And this is very important uh, because from an objective uh, perspective, uh, we get the confirmation of what we could assess uh, with the subjective methods. In conclusion, uh, glare is a phenomenon that uh, is triggered uh, when an uh, intense uh, source of light uh, hits the eye with without uh, allowing it to adapt uh, to a sudden uh, luminance uh, change. It can cause a discomfort, a pain, um, and increases with age uh, and increases the recovery time as well. And this is what uh, uh, the previous speakers also said. With elderly patients, uh, you have to be extremely uh, careful because uh, the clarity of vision decreases uh, and uh, uh, you also have a worsening of recovery time after glare and also the development of many conditions uh, as Professor Spinelli pointed out. So you have to be very uh, careful when driving at night. Thank you very much. A fantastic presentation. Uh, Bianchi and Ms. Senio. Uh, well, uh, great uh, eye physicians, there are very few eye physicians uh, who are able to explain uh, those concepts uh, so well. Finally, uh, tri uh, Professor Tripodi will uh, focus on the solutions. Uh, so how can uh, we remove uh, all these uh, uh, problems uh, uh, to the eye? So he will give us an update uh, on uh, specific solutions for driving. Uh, here's a um, he works for Essilor. I've known him uh, for more than 25 years uh, and uh, with regard uh, to the development of products uh, but also uh, aspects uh, specifically targeted uh, to physicians. Uh, let's uh, see the novelties uh, of uh, uh, lenses uh, to drive uh, as we've seen uh, from previous uh, speakers. Uh, the concept of vision and driving is so interesting when we speak about visual perception. And 90% of information used when you drive is of a visual kind. When we speak about a visual process and driving, well, you have the level of luminosity of the environment day uh, or night time driving in different uh, weather conditions. Uh, 
the characteristics of the object uh, we should observe. Uh, and uh, to end, uh, the ability of the optical system, uh, visual acuity and uh, refractive uh, conditions uh, and uh, eye movements. Uh, Vision and driving mean different things, different situations involving our eye, but especially vision conditions. Here you see glare, for example, or the difficulty you may have when you drive with fog or extreme rain, for example. And driving, as a consequence, means physically interacting with the environment and you, have, uh, uh, you should have adequate uh, styles uh, uh, to correctly interpret uh, the message. Is the vision with lenses always the same? And uh, at the same time, which are the new challenges? Uh, here you have the new challenges. Uh, luminosity in different uh, light conditions. Uh, you may imagine the eye, for example, inside a tunnel or at... Uh, Dawn. When you speak about adaptation to different kinds of luminosity, what you see here are sensitivity curves of the eye uh, at uh, uh, day and uh, by night. Uh, what happens? You have a system of activation uh, that is connected uh, to the diameter of the pupils that uh, uh, activates cones and rods. What you see here is uh, the diameter of the pupil, and it is affected by various uh, factors, uh, distance uh, and light, the impact of light, uh, and also age, uh, and also um, amitropia. And where is the technological response? Uh, uh, we need uh, to adopt uh, technology uh, and uh, wave technology uh, And uh, you mean uh, you have an added value in terms of technology. You have clear vision always, uh, enhanced contrasts in every condition of light, uh, and especially big luminosity for the lenses. Uh, such lenses uh, are a system applied uh, to lenses. Uh, the other challenge is reduction in clear reflection, especially during night vision. And here we should speak about uh, so-called uh, defondance. Uh, the previous uh, speaker spoke about it, uh, the concept of uh, stray light. It's just as if uh, it were a veil uh, over the retinal image. You see, uh, night vision, normal eye, visual acuity, uh, for example, uh, and the effect of the impact of stray light. Uh, what do diffundance and ophthalmic lenses mean? Uh, you can have generation of reflections uh, on the lenses uh, themselves. Uh, and uh, when we have to do with the lens, uh, you can have uh, multiple reflection, uh, and uh, it can lead to ghost images. Uh, and uh, you have disturbing uh, reflections uh, and in low amitropias, uh, and especially during night driving, for example, you can have uh, conditions uh, that uh, worsen uh, uh, vision. And uh, for uh, daytime vision, uh, you have uh, reflections uh, induced by objects uh, on the dashboard, placed on the dashboard. Speaking about uh, night vision, uh, for example, uh, rods uh, are photoreceptors uh, of the retina responsible for night vision uh, and uh, you see the curves of the sensitivity of the eye and uh, uh, you have a frequency of light uh, 507 nanometers uh, with regard uh, to this peak and uh, with this specific wavelength uh, you have the sensitivity of the eye, and the eye touches the highest level of night vision. And rods are especially sensitive 
and uh, they get saturated uh, when they are in front uh, of an alternation of intense sources of light uh, and uh, to obtain a maximum performance it is necessary to have the maximum level of transmission of light at this specific uh, wavelength. And uh, Where's the solution? You have lenses uh, or better anti-reflective uh, treatment uh, specifically for driving and it is reported here once again. You have the two wavelengths uh, of uh, sensitivity at uh, night and day vision, but in orange, the orange curve shows you the new anti-reflective uh, treatment. and. Uh, almost uh, uh, zero reflection and uh, if you consider 507 nanometers uh, where are the advantages the advantages are here you can have uh, minimized uh, reflection at night at uh, 505 nanometer nanometers uh, with a reduction to 90%. And the other advantage is to have a clear vision, extraordinary clear vision and reduction in clear and very good performance uh, uh, during the day. Uh, let's now see monofocal lenses. There are differences and differences uh, lie uh, here. The constructive technology is uh, highly digitalized. You have the use of the whole optical surface, maximum optimization irrespective of the prescription and maximum transparency and increase in contrast. And if you make a comparison with monofocal traditional lenses, construction is of a traditional kind and you lose pieces along the road in terms of use of the whole optical surface, uh, progressive lenses and driving. Uh, this has to do with older patients. Uh, let's see uh, the various conditions. Uh, the concept of uh, uh, side uh, observation, and Dr. Massini said it. Uh, uh, for example, uh, right side, left side, in this case, uh, uh, an area is not clear in terms of vision and uh, in the relationship between uh, progressive lenses, uh, mirrors and uh, car observation uh, with regard uh, to the central mirror, no problem because uh, the geometrical structure of the lens uh, uh, allows for um, have uh, movements of the eye and no interference. And, uh, rear uh, windows. In this case, uh, uh, movements of the visual axis, uh, left side, uh, you have problems uh, and uh, between 30 and 40 degrees. On the other side, uh, between 50 and 65 degrees. And then orientation toward the bottom. Then you have uh, uh, a patient using uh, lenses and uh, use of onboard instruments. Uh, uh, instruments are not so easy to be used. And so, also in this case, technology has taken uh, big steps forward. You have uh, highly specialized progressive lenses uh, with a specific uh, geometrical form, uh, well represented here, and uh, for sure, uh, vision uh, from distance uh, is privileged, but also intermediate uh, vision. For example, the need uh, to observe uh, information uh, given by the satellite navigator, for example, and uh, also uh, looking at uh, uh, rear uh, side uh, mirrors and traditional progressive lenses, if you make a comparison, you see traditional structure, uh, not specific uh, specialization areas, uh, and uh, so this type of solution is not uh, so highly specialized. One last uh, point, uh, in two points and then we're through. There are certain technologies uh, that uh, allow patients uh, to have almost total lenses, uh, photochromatic lenses uh, that uh, darken uh, also when you are in a car. 
and thanks uh, to specific molecules, uh, well, such molecules uh, uh, darken uh, also inside a car and they get uh, to category two in terms of darkening. And uh, such solutions uh, are uh, perfect for every light condition and uh, they protect uh, against uh, UVA, UVB uh, rays, but also against the blue light. Uh, and uh, in the case of blue light, you can go from 34% uh, to 95% in terms of darkening. One last point. Uh, polarizing lenses, uh, and the objective is to increase uh, contrast, but also safety. We shall speak about it shortly. Consider the difference between this condition and this condition, its effect uh, that you have uh, in uh, um, the use of polarizing lenses. Uh, and uh, on the right, uh, you see a problem of glare and uh, uh, the use uh, of uh, polarizing lenses on the right. Uh, times of reaction of the driver improve considerably. And uh, the driver can stop the vehicle seven meters before at a speed of 80 kilometers per hour. So this is a general overview about applied technologies. Uh, uh, technologies uh, that are more and more specialized uh, and uh, they represent a bridge uh, toward uh, better vision and a final solution. And with this, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And uh, with this, uh, we're through. I'd like to thank each one of you uh, for coming here. And uh, Dr. Galimberti, Dr. Gili. And uh, if you're here on Monday at uh, 3 p.m., our uh, association holds another workshop on driving license. Thanks a lot. Goodbye.